Today I'm going to read Teju Cole, Open City, Chapter 12. Teju Cole has been described as an aesthetic cosmopolitan. Born in 1975, he is an American writer, photographer and art historian. Open City is a documentary novel that explores layers of urban history and migrant experience set in a post 9-11 New York. The narrative is seen through the eyes of Julius, a young Nigerian-German psychiatrist who, in solitary walks, traverses and discovers New York. He writes about the mental associations that emerge through observation and of the culture and architecture of the city, and describes the thoughts of Julius as he thinks and reflects about art and memory and history, and the cross-currents of art, photography, history, music and literature. In short, the human condition. The visual arts and visits to galleries and museums are integral to the book. There is an extended description of colonial period paintings of John Brewster at the American Folk Art Museum and the 20th century Hungarian photographer Martin Munkaxi at the International Center of Photography, which are described in the form of a narrative documentary. On Sunday, I went down to the International Centre of Photography in Midtown. The main attraction there was a show on Martin Munkaxi. Admission was reduced for students, so I lied, flashing my expired medical school ID. The show was crowded, and the prints unexpectedly lively. Munkaxi's journalism was dynamic. He liked sports poses, youth people in motion. In these snaps, which were so carefully composed but always seemed to have been taken on the go, I could see the alertness that he brought to his other masterful work, such as the photograph of three African boys running into the surf in Liberia. It was from him, and from this picture in particular, that Henri Cartier-Bresson had developed the ideal of the decisive moment. Photography seemed to me, as I stood there in the white gallery, with its rows of pictures and its press of murmuring spectators, an uncanny art like no other. One moment in all of history was captured, but the moments before and after it disappeared into the onrush of time. Only that selected moment itself was privileged, saved, for no other reason than its having been picked out by the camera's eye. Munkaxi moved from Hungary to Germany, where he would remain until 1934. He worked for the Berliner Illustrierte Zeitung, a weekly paper of photographs and advertising. It was for this paper that he made his picture of the Liberian boys in 1930. The Illustrierte Zeitung had covered the First World War and would, after Munkaxi's departure, cover the second as well. In the ICP show, copies of the magazine showing Munkaxi's work had been placed in plexiglass cases at waist height. A man in his 60s was studying the same case as I was and we stood side by side, leaning over the clear case. His face was relaxed and he wore a yellow windbreaker. Seeing how intently I was studying the magazine, he said, without turning to look at me, that the spelling was a mistake. What was printed on the newspaper was illustrata instead of illustrieta. He said that had been the case since the first issue. In the first issue, the gentleman said, it had been an error, but later it became a kind of trademark for the magazine and was left unchanged. This was familiar to him, he said, because he remembered the magazine from his childhood. It had come to their house weekly when he was a little boy in Berlin. Sensing my interest, the man spoke on, and our eyes moved over the surfaces of Munkaxi's photograph as he talked. There was one that showed a field of young Germans lying in the sun, which must have been taken from a zeppelin. The bodies, filling every available space, made a flat, abstract pattern against the field. The man spoke with the slowness of someone who was entering a memory, but it was not a foggy memory, and he spoke about it clearly, as though it had only just happened. I was 13 when we left Berlin in 1937, he said, and New York has been my home ever since. My guess of his age had been far off, and yet he looked nothing like an 84-year-old. He was fit, and the way he moved his body was unimpeded by age. There was a lightness, too, in the way he spoke about his boyhood. 
almost as if he were talking about something else, something less frightening, something less littered with disaster. It wasn't until much later, he said, that they finally adopted Illustrieta with the extra E. But this spelling, this is the one I knew in those days. Have you been to Berlin? I told him I had, and that I had enjoyed the city very much. I've never been back, he said, but I liked it a lot when I was there. It must have been an unimaginably different place back then, I said. I did not tell them that my mother and my Oma had been there too, as refugees near the end of the war and afterward and that I was myself, in this distant sense, also a Berliner. If we had talked more, I would have told him only that I was from Nigeria, from Lagos. As it turned out, just then his wife, or an old lady who I, pre I presumed was his wife, came to join him. She looked much older than he did, and used a walker. With a smile and nod to me, he moved on with her to another part of the exhibition. The mood of Mankaxi's photographs darkened as the 1920s became the 1930s, and the soccer players and fashion models gave way to the cool tensions of a military state. This story, told countless times, retains its power to quicken the heart. Always one holds out the secret hope that things will turn out differently, and that the record of these years will show wrongs on a scale closer to the rest of human history. The enormity of what actually happened, no matter how familiar it is, no matter how often it is reiterated, always comes as a shock. And that was what happened when among the photograph of troops and parades at the opening of the Reichstag in 1933, there was the image, at once expected and unexpected, in the middle ground of a row of soldiers of the new German Chancellor. Walking close behind him with his contorted nightmare of a face was Goebbels. I happened to be looking at this picture at the same time a young couple was. I stood to the left of it and they to the right. They were Hasidic Jews. I had no reasonable access to what being there in that gallery might mean for them. The undiluted hatred I felt for the subjects of the photo was, in the couple, transmuted into what? What was stronger than hate? I did not know and could not ask. I needed to move away immediately, needed to rest my eye elsewhere and be absent from this silent encounter into which I had inadvertently barged. The young couple stood close to each other, not speaking. I couldn't bear to look at them, or at what they were looking at, any longer. The show turned on that axis. It became something else and couldn't be saved. There were other photographs, images from Mukaxi's successful career in the 1940s in Hollywood, stylish pictures of socialites and actors, Joan Crawford, Fred Astaire, but the afternoon was poisoned, and I wanted only to get home and sleep, and begin my year of work. I moved with the crowd towards the exit and caught a last glimpse as I passed the museum shop of the old Berliner and his wife. His long-saved story of Listreta had found the time and place for its airing. Unimaginable how many small stories people all over the city carried around with them. It was only then that I noted that Munkaxi, the photographer of the so-called Day of Potsdam, into whose camera one seemingly ordinary moment in Berlin in 1933 was secreted away for future viewers was himself Jewish. <laughs>